We're going to do a little bit of everything today, but it's all about money for freelancers. You might be a, a translator or an interpreter. Uh, you might be full-time or part-time. You might be semi-retired. We come from all different situations. It seems like in our industry, most of us are freelancers. Most of us used to do something else and kind of stumbled into translation and interpretation because we were looking for some variety or for more flexibility or just to do something with our languages. And so a lot of us don't come from a business background, an entrepreneurial background. We're not used to handling the financial side. We're great with the language side and the people side, but the, the money and the technical side is more challenging. And so today we're gonna highlight some uh, simple and low cost ways to take care of the money side as painlessly as possible so you can focus on communicating. These are the topics. Um, first of all, the introduction, you are your own bookkeeper, you're your own boss. They always say that like it's a good thing, but it's really a mixed blessing. <laughs> your fine print of figuring out what to charge, not just for your main service, but also additional services. Let's say you're mostly an interpreter, but they ask you to translate something. You want to know how much to charge and be able to tell them quickly so they can decide if they're going to go with you or not. But it's complicated when it's a new kind of assignment. And so we'll sort of talk through that thought process and when to raise rates and how to raise rates. Um, well, then we'll look at creating a paper trail of written um, communication with the client so that you can make sure that one, that they're not a scam, and two, that you both agree on what you're gonna do and how much they're gonna pay you. Then we'll have a little discussion session, breakout rooms, and come back to uh, talk about invoicing, um, what to do when people don't pay on time, how to crank up the pressure in a polite and professional way, and then finally, if you have to take somebody to court, kind of the uh, entry level um, overview for small claims court and how any entrepreneur or sole business person can do that cheap or free in a lot of jurisdictions. And we'll have a little anecdote about our experiences with that. Rare, it happens rarely. Hopefully you don't get to that point. Margaret, do you wanna jump in at any, at any point? Just uh, raise your finger or shake your hands wildly. I'll, I'll turn the mic over to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I, I'm unmuted too, so I can just jump in okay. and turn over you whenever I want. All right. Thanks. Feel free. Um. So we're making T-shirts. Uh, this is our team jersey. We are team <laughs> freelancer, and we're all going to commit to this uh, slogan. This is the main idea. If you get nothing else, take a screen capture, write this down, get it tattooed on your arm. You know, write it up in sharpie on your on your wall. Find out in advance who's going to be paying you and agree in writing with that same person on what your rates and terms are. If you follow this rule, 99% of your problems go away. Any problems that we've had in the past have usually been from bending this rule at some point and either not knowing who is gonna pay us or they not agreeing in writing only verbally or in a text message or in a Facebook post or something really sketchy. And so it led to controversy later on once we, we sent the bill. Is that right, Margaret? Yeah, and, and sometimes you're you're booking with one person and you're getting paid by a different person. You just got to be real clear right from the get go who is paying you, and then be in touch with that person to negotiate. Don't the booker doesn't control the the purse, and so they they have to get you there. But then the person that actually holds the purse strings is the one you want to be dealing with and making your paper trail with. Correct. Thank you. Okay, so yay, you're your own bookkeeper. How exciting. No more boss, no more boss. No one can tell us what to do. That means that we are now not only the professional uh, interpreter or translator, we are also our own bookkeeper and marketing department and uh, PR and transportation and logistics and tech support and everything. So maybe you are part of a small community of interpreters and you help each other out. Uh, you have colleagues, a partner, a life partner like Margaret and me, we, we uh, each bring certain strengths to the business. But if you're entirely on your own, then um, bookkeeping is going to be probably your biggest concern outside of um, the actual linguistic work. And so um, a good uh, starting point is even if you hate uh, computers, raise your hand if you hate computers. Computers are the bane of your existence. Margaret, do, do computers like you? Oh, well, no, they don't like me. I And I sort of have a love-hate relationship with them. <laughs> sometimes sometimes um, 
computers don't make any sense and uh, they can be frustrating and break when you, when you most need them. But the software is getting better and it's getting more customer friendly and simpler to use each year. And so some of the top programs for tiny businesses like us, if we're self-employed or uh, sole proprietors or DBAs, uh, QuickBooks Self-Employed, Zero, FreshBooks, Wave. Uh, these are all companies that make bookkeeping software that is both computer-based and mobile-based, so you can use it on your phone. It's a, there are places where you can track your expenses and your mileage and keep that uh, together. So at the end of the year, you can report that in your tax return and you can connect certain expenses with certain jobs and match everything up. So you may want to have your own bookkeeping software and still have a bookkeeper if you can afford it. When we stopped doing our own bookkeeping and were able to outsource our bookkeeping, it was cheaper than we thought. And the amount of headache it cured us from and not having to deal with that was well worth it. But at the very beginning, if you're bootstrapping, yeah. bootstrapping means you're trying to cover all your expenses without going into debt. And when you're bootstrapping, you have to do it yourself. Um, educate yourself, um, watch YouTube videos, uh, go through tutorials, uh, read reviews of these different uh, programs, pick one and then try it out. Margaret? Yeah, um, I agree with that. And when you're small, it doesn't, like if, if it's just you and you're not doing a lot of, of like it, if this is sort of a side gig for you, then get a little software and, and do what you can. I wouldn't invest in a bookkeeper, but you'll know i think you'll know when when you kind of get to that point where you're just like it's just like this is all i do and it's getting confusing and then reach out to somebody who does it for a living and just like we are always saying don't have your cousin interpret in court for you hire a professional same thing applies here when when the finances get a little more than you can handle pay someone who knows what they're doing so that you don't end up just <laughs> in small claims court because you screwed up your books about or something. Yeah. And so I'd like to um, get in what is a little software. <laughs> um, I think by a little software, she means uh, entry level, uh, simple, simple bookkeeping without all the yeah, problems. Yeah, yeah. So, like a basic, basic um, bookkeeping program. Right. Um, we use QuickBooks. We've been happy with it. Uh, yeah. We have the, we don't use the self-employed version. We have a more complex version. But if you do use um, bookkeeping software, please get in the chat and tell us what you use. And we can sort of see if a consensus emerges, what is a popular program for freelancers? Wave. Mm -hmm. And if you're unfamiliar with it, um, talk to other interpreters, find out what they're using and find somebody, who, find someone who is using the one you wanna use. and and get together with them and find out a little bit more about it, figure out some of the pros and cons, or just ask around if you're not sure what you want. Ask around yeah. to your, your colleagues and see what people are using and what works best and why they like it and why they don't, and figure out which, which pros you like the best and which cons you're willing to live with. Yeah. And find one that works for you. Um, yes, uh, Dana, I, I believe Wave is free or has a free version. And a couple of people say they use Excel. That's true. Um, Excel or Google Sheets uh, is the same thing. That's a, that is a bookkeeping software in a simple sense in that you can list the jobs and list the dates and list how much you charge and list the mileage. And so that's a, I would say that's a step up from doing it on paper because it's adding everything up for you. And so that's, uh, that's a good place to start. Time, mileage, um, and tracking software. Um, QuickBooks um, Self-Employed does have a, a tracking it, on the app, you can track some of that. Um, there are other ones as well. Mark, were you going to? Yeah, I used to have an app on my phone when I was um, interpreting before the pandemic, when I was driving around a lot to assignments. Um, I use one called uh, Mile Q, I think. And it's just an app that's always on on your phone and it's always tracking wherever you're going. And at the end of a trip, it pops up and says, was this business mileage or personal mileage? And you push a button and then you can like tag it with the name of a client or something. And at the end of the month and at the end of the year, it gives you a report for the miles that you drove and you can deduct those from your taxes. I think, I think it's called Mile Q, but there's several companies that do that. Ah, Gina's husband's an accountant and he's volunteering to help all of us. <laughs> Thank you. Just for free. No, forward, just kidding. Forward your paperwork to Gina. <laughs> yeah, and Toggle is a good option. 
in terms of tracking time, but Toggle doesn't track miles. Um, you can simply map the route that you went. You know, if, if you drive someplace, then you can always go back later and just say, okay, I started at this point, I started at that point, Google Maps, this is the route I went, so it's this many miles. And that's important if you're charging the client for miles, you need to know how many miles you went. But like Marco said, if you're trying to um, use that later in, for tax purposes, you want to know how many miles you drove precisely, not just how much time you spent on the road. So you do want to keep track of that either in something like a QuickBooks self-employed that has the, the tracking capability or on a spreadsheet or some way, but keep track of it. Um, the, the bottom line of all of this is, is keep track of things. Don't lose stuff. Don't, don't think it doesn't matter. It matters. Keep track of it. Get in the habit of keeping track of all the things. Don't be like me my first year where you wait until January and then scramble to try to recreate the records because you didn't you don't know where they are and they're just it's a it's a mess. So okay, moving on. Um you will probably start out with a uh a sole proprietorship, meaning you are doing business in your own name. Um your business is um Margaret Hansen Spanish interpreting service. Um, you have a bank account, you have a personal bank account, and you use it for business expenses too. That's how most people get in when they're just sort of uh, trying out the, the profession. Um, quickly, you'll realize that it's easier, like at, by the end of your first year, then when you have to go back through and sort of delineate what were personal expenses, what were business expenses, you realize it'd be really nice if I had two different accounts for these. It might yeah. be a credit card that you just use for business expenses, or it might be a separate uh, business checking account and personal checking account. But to um, sort of the, the scale of uh, business growth is after a sole proprietorship, you can, it's, you can take on an assumed name. That's where you're no longer just your own personal name, but your text and translation, for example. And it costs here um, in Texas, I think it costs like $15 to, to file an assumed name. It's super cheap. And it allows you to have a little more privacy. Maybe you're not paranoid, but you are aware of the danger of identity theft and having your name out in too many places, and you don't want to do business on your, done to your own name. You want to come up with a cool sounding business name and create a little bit of a more sort of separation. Um, that's called an assumed name or a DBA, doing business as. And if you get a checking account, you can put your assumed name on there, and people can write the checks to your company name rather than just to you. And it makes you look a little more professional and credible and, and bigger than you actually are. Um, and if you're doing business with a, a large entity like a court system, they might be more comfortable doing business with somebody under their business name rather than a personal name that might feel too small to them because they're used to business to business. Then after the DBA or assumed name, you uh, can file a limited liability company. And that's, do you remember, Margaret, like $400 or something? For oh, us. I don't remember. It's going to be different remember. in every state. Um, but just And Google it was so long ago that whatever we paid, you wouldn't won't be the same, but um, if you just Google the name of your state and LLC, you'll get the form and you'll get lawyers who are offering to do it for you for 10 times as much or a do it yourself kit that you can fill out, which is going to be kind of confusing and kind of a pain, but a lot cheaper. I think we filed our own LLC. We didn't have a lawyer or attorney involved. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then if you grow to the point where you start hiring other interpreters or other people on your staff and you're an actual company, um, then you might consider an S corp or a corporation. Then there's different business structures after that, but those are way beyond the scope of today's presentation. We're talking freelancing now, so you'll yeah. probably be in one of those first uh, two or three categories. Um, is there if there's anybody who has filed an LLC for themselves? Uh, could you put it in the chat just so we can see if that's been helpful for you as a freelancer? Yes, I will be sending you the recording. Um, the LLC, uh, there's a question in the chat, like when is it useful to do an LLC? Again, we are not business consultants, but we found the LLC helpful in that if somebody tries to sue us um, for something that I do wrong as an interpreter or Margaret as a translator, um, we have a little bit more protection of our personal assets from being sued for business problems. So we formed an LLC and we got errors and in admissions insurance and that way we can go after um, some of the government contracts and some of them require you to have insurance and it provides more of a protection so that if something goes awry, goes awry, most of the business laws have to do with lawsuits and protecting people from lawsuits. 
Um, we haven't been sued. We've been doing this for 23 years. We've never been sued. It's very rare that a, a translator would be sued and I've never heard of an interpreter being sued. So we are not um, a, an industry that is prone to lawsuit abuse. So, but as you grow, you'll probably start out just by yourself. It's you, people hire you to do something, you charge them, they pay you and that's it. But real soon, they'll ask you, hey, can you take this assignment? And you can't. And so you'll probably start making friends in your same language pair that you can refer it to. And when they have extra assignments, they refer them back to you and you just trade back and forth. That's sort of the uh, second level of customer service. Um, some interpreters stop there. Some of them go even farther and say, wow, I, I get a lot more demand than I can fulfill. I would like to start hiring other interpreters. And that's when you sort of convert from a freelancer to a mini agency or a micro agency, let's say a one person agency. And you say, um, I'm going to tell the insurance company it'll be $150 an hour for the deposition. And I'm gonna ask my buddies, hey, who will take $130 an hour deposition? Um, and I'm keeping 20 hours of finder's fee. You wanna be transparent about that because these are your friends and colleagues. Um, but if everybody's on board that you're taking a little uh, administrative fee, um, then that can become a sideline for your business too. We, um, Margaret and I have experimented with that and have found that um, it's, it's a lot harder to do quality control as an interpreter agency. Uh, we send out a freelancer and we can't really tell whether they're doing a good job or not. And we are kind of perfectionist, perfectionists. We want to be able to review everything that we give to a client. Uh, would you agree, Margaret? Yeah, I am thinking about all the double and triple checking, like with, with the translation side. I don't do interpreting, but I do translation work um, in addition to the financial half that I do. Um, and so somebody will translate it and somebody will proof it. And maybe all I'm doing is notarizing it, but I'm still just going through it with a fine tooth comb and saying, oh, you, you missed this thing because I want it to be exactly right. And with interpreting, you send somebody out, you know, if I say, oh, well, I can't handle that job, Marco, can you go do it? I don't know what Marco is doing because I can't sit there and babysit him. And so I hope he's doing a good job. I hope he's representing me well because they, they called me and asked me for an interpreter and I sent Marco so I hope he's representing me well, but I don't know. And, and, and if I, you know, you, you, there are ways to do it. You can do following up and, you know, checking with your, your client and, and that sort of thing. But for us, we personally chose to not pursue that further because it was more than we wanted to do, but it's not more than can be done. It's just more than we wanted to do. Yes. All right. So. Um, I'm going to move on here. Uh, this, this is just a quick uh, uh, plain language glossary of some of the keywords that we're going to be talking about today. I'll give everybody a minute to read those. Probably bootstrapping and dunning are the least common ones. A lot of these are common knowledge. Bootstrapping is an entrepreneurial term. If you're running your own business and you don't want to go into debt, you don't want to put anything on credit cards, you want to pay your own expenses, that's um, lifting yourself up by your own bootstraps is the old expression for not relying on anybody else. And it's a, it's a good business model because it avoids debt and it makes sure that your growth is organic and um, that the market can bear your growth. And just right. to address just to address a couple of things that came up in the um, chat, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about rates later and um, and the quality control thing. I think part of that is just if you pass your exam, your court interpreter exam, they just assume you can do it and off you go. But yeah, there isn't a, a great way to to evaluate in the field. Maybe we'll work on that. That'll be our next big project, Marco, when we have free time. Hey, yeah. Our, our, our last child's about to graduate and move away next year, and then we'll just be bored sitting around looking for We will projects. have nothing to do. <laughs> okay. So a big uh, question when you first um, get your credential or hang out your shingle as an interpreter or translator is, how much do I charge? And people are afraid to talk about it. They're like, you know, my mom raised me not to discuss money. It's rude. I don't want to ask other people how much they would charge. Um, 
And some people say, oh, we can't talk about it because it's uh, price fixing. Um, the, the Federal Trade Commission will come after us if we discuss prices. So if anybody has heard that, if you're a member of the American Translators Association, for example, um, there was a little um, brouhaha 20 years ago when the FTC told the ATA, the American Translators Association, make sure you guys aren't price fixing. You can't all agree we're gonna charge this minimum rate because that's creating a monopoly. And so ever since then, translators have been worried, but we can talk about how much we charge, it's fine. You know, every business talks about how much they charge and we just can't uh, pressure each other to charge a certain amount. We can't say you're undercutting me and that's uh, unethical and I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to- Blackball you. Send Guido after you with uh, yeah. cement overshoes, right? Blackball you, that's, yeah, that's what I was looking for. So um, let's say I am a, a uh, Karen interpreter in Minnesota, and I, we might have one here today. I don't know if he's on yet. Um, that's a, a less common language in a very distinct um, uh, geographic uh, region. And so I would just get onto Google, first of all, and type in Karen translator interpreter, because nobody but us knows the difference, uh, Minnesota uh, rates. And then I would try Karen translator interpreter um, uh, language, Minnesota, uh, and then some cities in there. And what you're gonna start getting is blogs and agencies. Um, the blogs will be people uh, usually working for an agency who are writing articles about rates and maybe they have some charts and some surveys on there. The agencies might be actual rate sheets, um, amounts that they're charging. And you can uh, just start taking notes. What you're doing is this is a process called mystery shopping like stores that hire people to come in and pretend to be customers and walk around buying stuff. And then they leave and they write a little report for the store saying, um, this is how I was treated. This is uh, what your staff does well, what they do poorly. So you're pretty much uh, mystery shopping for yourself. You're pretending that you are a consumer of your own services. And you're going out there and seeing if I were trying to find a Karen interpreter in Minnesota, how would I find this person? Um, what would be the top page of Google hits and how much would other um, providers be charging for this? Um, so a, there are surveys. Uh, the ATA, the American Translators Association, does a survey, I think, every year. Maybe it's not that often, um, but I put a link in here and you can click on not this one on your screen, but the one that I emailed um, and study that. Uh, if you're an ATA member, I believe you have further access like to all the details. If you're not an ATA member, then probably the public version is, is uh, more limited. Um, but you can join associations. Uh, there's the National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators, um, the American Translator Association. Lots of uh, major metro areas have their own association and lots of specialties um, like medical interpreters have national associations and educational interpreters. And if you do more than just legal, I, I'm mostly a legal interpreter, um, but if, you, if you're also medical and also educational and also religious and also community, um, then each of those associations will give you an idea for um, how much they're charging. And you can just ask people say, hey, uh, do you mind if I ask uh, what your rates are? And if they are well-established freelancers, they probably have a PDF of it and they'll just email it to you and you can see exactly what they charge. I'm looking down at the chat here. Um, how do you get your name to show up in your city on Google if someone is looking for your services? Oh, Shelia has a search engine optimization question. That is a wonderful question. Um, first of all, uh, join LinkedIn and write a very detailed LinkedIn profile and then use it regularly. Uh, Google loves LinkedIn. Um, and if you are the only provider for your language in your area, that's, that's where you start. It's free. Um, after that, Google Maps, I would say, is the second best place. You probably don't want to put your home address on Google Maps as a business, but if you have like a P.O. box or um, some shared workspace or some, some um, physical address where you can uh, have as your, as your place of business, um, Google Map hits will be way up high for anybody in your area. I would say those are the two places to start. After that, it, it becomes a matter of building your own website and going through all these search engine optimization wizards. 
Yeah, uh, uh, Google reviews are a tremendous help once you have clients. Encouraging them to to give you a review helps a lot. And um, and LinkedIn, make sure you're using all the words that you can think of that would possibly be searched for if someone was trying to find you. Because if 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 somebody's typing in uh, licensed court interpreter and you never mention licensed on your LinkedIn, then that that's not going to hit your profile. I mean, it, it would find court and interpreter, but the more words you can include in your LinkedIn profile that people might use to search for you, the more likely it is that you will come up as a match in that Google yeah. search. Right. There are places where you can get um, lists of popular key keywords for different categories and and weaving all those into your little uh, blurb will make you rank higher. Mm -hmm. A question from Anar Bhatt. Um, Margaret, what would be the best rate for translation per word or per hour? Oh, that's great. Per word or per hour or per page. Margaret, can you comment on that? Do we, do we want to get into that now? Um, um, just briefly. Briefly. OK, so um, my rule is if if it's something if I can glance at it and know about how much work it's going to be because it's something I have done a lot of, then I will charge by the page because it's faster to, for me. The longer I spend calculating how much it's going to cost, the more I'm already investing in a project that I haven't been paid for. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time figuring out how much to charge for something. And so if I can look at it, I have done 500 million birth certificates, 500 million death certificates. I have done so many marriage certificates from the state of Texas, from every state in Mexico. Like there are certain things that I've done so many of that I can at a glance say, ah, I know how much I'm gonna charge you for this because I've got templates set up and I know what I'm getting into basically. So I can charge by the page and say, this is how much it's gonna cost you and I can have this done in this amount of time. If it's something longer, divorce decrees, for example, because divorce decrees are bespoke. They are specific to the two people getting divorced <laughs> and, <laughs> and they are not, they're not cookie cutter at all, ever. Um, Especially Venezuelan. Right. <laughs> but all of them. I mean, if, if you're dealing with the decree, not just the certificate that says we got divorced, but if you're dealing with a decree, it's it, it's going to be lengthy and wordy, and it's going to detail all the ins and outs of the how they're separating their lives. And so something like that, I'm going to charge by the word because every single word is going to be new and different compared to a birth certificate, which always lists the same information. And so for something like that, I would charge by the word. Um, in translation, you don't charge by the hour typically. Some people do, but it's just, I mean, like I I pay my, I've got a couple of people that work for me full time and I pay them by the hour because they're doing admin stuff for me as well. They're doing emailing, they're doing phone calls, they're doing invoicing, they're doing different things. Um, but translation work itself, you you pay by the word or by the page because you're if if you're slow, that's not my fault. And so I'm not gonna pay you by the hour to dawdle. And, and take a long time to do the work. So it's, it's a by the word or by the page. And, and for me, usually a lot of people do it by the word um, because it's just more specific. Um, but if it's something that I've done a lot of, I do by the page just so that I don't have to waste time counting a bunch of words. <laughs> yeah. So Margaret, if somebody calls you up and says, uh, hey, uh, I need something translated, it's a uh, power of attorney. What's your first question? What language? Oh, Spanish. Spanish into English or the other way? Oh, uh, I guess it's English into Spanish. Okay, English into Spanish. Uh, I will need to see your power of attorney before I can quote a price exactly because some powers of attorney are one page and short and sweet and some powers of attorney are multiple pages and they're legal pages and they have stamps and stickers and seals and signatures on them and I have to include all of that in my translation. So I tell you what, if you can upload your document to me and let me have a look at it, I can have, a, I will get right back to you with a quote on how much it'll cost and how fast I can get it done for you. Oh, oh, it just has a few words on it. Can you give me like a ballpark how much? Uh, I, I could, uh, but I have found <laughs> that, that, uh, that not everybody looks at a document the same way I do. And like I say, every stamp and sticker and seal and signature has to be included. And so if, if I can just have a quick look at it, I can give you, a, I, I'd rather do that than wildly send you in, in the wrong direction price-wise. Okay, thank you. And Frank is asking in the chat about 
uploading a document. We just have a, a little web form on our website where people submit documents and give us some of their contact information. Uh, if, you, if you don't have a website, then you could do the same thing by emailing it. Yeah, emailing um, or using a Google, a Dropbox or a Google. Um, uh, there's a way to do it in Google also, but we don't, we're not going to worry about that. Yeah, a Google Drive. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, uh, on our, we translate uh, seals and stickers on official documents, like um, documents produced by the government. So, and that's be uh, just excuse me, and that's because um, in order to render a complete and accurate translation, um, you have to translate every word that's on the page that you can read. Because if, for example, the birth certificate says this certificate is not valid without the red circular seal of the um, authorized agent, and then there's no red circular seal, then you, you know, like they need to know that. And so if there, there's like, if there's a spot where there's the seal is supposed to go and it says red seal goes here, you know, and, and you don't, they don't, it, it helps sometimes rather than thinking in the languages that you do to think if, if someone handed this to me and it was in Chinese, or this was in Russian, or this was in, and, and picture it in a, in a writing system that you are completely unfamiliar with. You would want to know what every character, every pictograph, everything was, because you don't have any idea what it says. And that's how monolinguals feel when they pick up a document that it, that's in a language that's intimately familiar to you. It looks so foreign to them. And so they, they just, they, they don't know what any of it is. And so they want to know everything. And so imagine that you're looking at a document in, in a writing system that is completely foreign to you and think, okay, well, even though I know this just says, you know, syntax or just means there's it's blank. Obviously, it means it's blank, right? Obviously. But Everybody if that were that. right, but if it were like a Chinese symbol or or Arabic, you know, quick little handwritten squiggle, and you think, I mean, that doesn't even really say anything, right? It's nothing, it's not important. But somebody who can't tell what that means, it, it is important. They they need to know that it doesn't say canceled or void or inapplicable. Forged. <laughs> Forged, yeah, yeah. Illegal document, do not accept. <laughs> um, and then the last point in the bullets here are, will you charge them in advance or when you finish, when you finish interpreting or deliver your, your product, will you charge half in advance or half afterwards? And um, that's... That kind of depends on who you're doing business with. Uh, we've we've come up with a system, a policy that if it's a company, a business to business client, and we have agreed in writing by email uh, on the terms and the agreements, then we will wait and bill them upon delivery. We'll send them the translation or finish the interpretation and then invoice them. But if it's somebody new and if they're sketchy at all, or if it's a, a private individual who we've never met, um, then we charge them the full price in advance. And if they say, oh, you know, $800 to translate all these documents, I don't have it. Can I give you half now and then half when I pick it up? Then we're sort of like splitting the risk in half. And that, that's, that's reasonable too. But we always ask for 100% in advance and make that our default for individuals. And make sure that they're, they're putting enough over the barrel that, that they won't run. So... Sometimes you'll have someone say, I need you to do this. And here's some money. Here's $11. That's all I have in cash. Take my $11. <laughs> and you're like, well, oh. yeah, the, true story. $11 sat on my desk for like five years. Because um, she was like, I mean, that's all I have. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. I'll just, I'll get started on it. When you come pick it up, then you can pay me the rest. And I never saw her again. And so I did this translation for $11. And I just kept holding on to the $11 thinking, surely this one's going to come back. <laughs> and we closed that office and we worked out of our house for a while. And there was a and finally I was like, you know what? I'm just spending the 11 bucks. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but it wasn't enough of an investment for her to come back and pay me the rest later. And so you, you need to make sure that it's going to hurt them enough to lose that money or else it's, it's not enough. Right. Right. Um, I and don't some people you, you can't. Some people you can't do that with, like court systems, you can't, they don't pay you for interpreting in advance, period. But um, but some things you can get half and half or whatever. But there is technology on the horizon. We have a, not a guest speaker, but a guy who's going to pop on here probably in about an hour named Seth Hammock, who taught our webinar on interpreting at depositions last year, I think. And he's working on 
what I call the Airbnb of interpreting. It's sort of like the Airbnb app, but instead of for booking a room overseas, it's for booking an interpreter and you have to pay in advance and then the app holds onto the money. And after you finish interpreting, you say, okay, I completed the assignment. It took three and a half hours. And then the client clicks on it. Yeah, it took three and a half hours and they did fine. And then you're paid right away. You don't have to send an invoice. It's all handled um, in the cloud somewhere. And so if Seth is able to join us later on, he'll give us a little sketch on how that works. And it's something to look forward to that'll simplify the freelancers invoicing process. So if you are, for example, a court interpreter, or if court is one of the kinds of interpreting that you do, um, in Texas, we surveyed um, licensed court interpreters and found out that as of last year, um, some of them were earning over 140 an hour. Those are probably also federally certified interpreters who can command the higher rates. Um, the average was about $97 an hour. Um, we worked out the math. Uh, Frank, no, Seth is not an attorney. Um, he's another one of the speakers. So you're- And he is a court interpreter. Uh, right. Your, your rates, if you're outside of Texas or if you're not a, a Spanish, most of these were Spanish, um, will be different. I've heard recently that California court interpreters in some contexts are charging $360 an hour. And if you are, if you can verify that, please get in the chat and say it's true. And also I'm packing my bags and moving to California. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> and so that that's triple what um, we charge in the Austin market. Um, and I know the cost of living is is high in California, but I would be amazed if they're really making 360 an hour uh, a freelancer rate. Yes, that's what I heard, but I haven't verified it. You know, I've never actually been to California. <laughs> Question from you, Don. When you charge by the word, you use the word count displayed on a word document. Well, if it's Chinese, then you charge by the character. Um, if it's in an editable Word document where everything is actually editable text and not just a JPEG that's been placed on there, um, then yes, you use the, um, the source language Word document uh, word count. Um, sometimes if, they just give you a PDF or a handwritten document. Yeah, I was going to say, if it's a conversion from a PDF, you can't rely on it because there's going to be too many artifacts from the PDF and it messes up the, the word count because they just put in all kinds of weirdness and so you can't rely on that. And if you're receiving it in a non-editable format, like a PDF or a JPEG, you're just going to have to go through and, and and I've developed systems for counting and averaging and, you know, so that I can do it pretty quickly. And I call it an approximate word count. I don't usually count every single word. Um, but but if you do have a reliable, you know, if it, if it comes to you in a word format and and it's clear, then yeah, that's the fastest way to do it for sure. <laughs> Anna Sherman has confirmed the California uh, rumor. <laughs> yeah, I don't really want to move there. I want to move to like, I don't know, South America or something. Um, thank you. New York courts pay $150 for one to four hours and $300 for four plus hours. Interesting. Yeah, that's a different system. Not not by the 150 per hour or 154 four hours? I think, I think it's for the block, for the four hour block. Ooh. Oh, well, we're not moving to New York then. Yeah. Some clients will let you just set your own rates. They're like, well, how much do you charge? And you tell them, and then they either take it or leave it, or they shop around and come back to you when they find out you're the only one that's available. While other big clients, like a, a county that hires 100 different freelancers, will probably have written policies, and they say, this is, how, this is how much we'll pay, and not a penny more. But thanks to the pandemic, yay, pandemic. Now we can interpret all over because all judges have adapted to Zoom. And so there are more and more interpreters that are now adding credentials for surrounding states and for states all around the country, or they are getting on the federal uh, roster either by taking the test in Spanish or through other means for other languages. New York is 160 for half a day and 300 for a full day. Time to move to California, guys. Um, are the courts in Texas still charging a paltry 40 an hour? Um, paying an interpreter 40 an hour. A municipal court might, uh, but I, I don't know any district or county court that pays under 80 an hour uh, for Spanish and probably more for Arabic and French, half day being four hours. Okay, yeah, the, the rates and terms are, are traditions that have developed within a certain region and community. So you have to 
take them as a starting point. Yeah. All right. So um, you should have your own uh, fee structure and terms written up. This is not exactly mine. This is based loosely on mine, but um, some of it has changed since I was brainstorming this. Um, I do interpreting and translating and transcription of recordings and um, Margaret and I notarize certified translations and all these other sort of language related services. You don't have to do all these, of course, maybe you just do interpreting, but whatever you do, get it all down in writing and figure out this is uh, fair given my current market and my credentials. And I'm going to stick to this and use this as my starting point. Um, do you negotiate? If somebody haggles, haggles down your price, Margaret, how do you, how do you reply? <laughs> is this a haggling kind of industry? Uh, no, no. Uh, bottom line, no. If, have I ever changed my price? Sure, of course. Once in a while, I think, yeah, you know what? This is fine. I know I can do this fast. And, and you know, this person seems nice or whatever because because i'm i work for myself and i i had that prerogative i had to work for for a big company that says this is how much it has to be and you know but by and large i'm not going to change my price just because somebody's like wow that's so expensive yes well that's because the work that i'm giving you is quality work based on 15 years of experience and credentials that have been received over the years and people come to us with their rejected translations and I have to fix their mistakes and my translations don't get rejected. So you're paying me the top dollar so that your translation is gonna be received and accepted by the end user and not kicked back for ridiculous mistakes. And that's, that's what you get to do. And somebody mentioned that in the chat, I think about rates that you get to command a higher price if you're, if you're experienced and do a good job. And if you, if you're not good at what you do, then you need to get better and then you can charge more. And if you're a beginner, it's natural to charge at the lower end of the range because you're trying to build up your client list. Um, but you don't want to charge uh, half of the average of other interpreters or translators. There, there is such a thing as uh, self-respect and um, presenting yourself as a professional. Some people will be suspicious of you if you charge too little, and they won't want to hire you because they're like, oh, I normally spend 100 an, hour, 100 an hour on the service and he's wanting to do it for 25. This must be a scam or he must be a flake or there must be something wrong with him if that's all he charges. Mm -hmm. And so if you present yourself professionally and charge a professional market rate, then while some people can't afford it, you will overall uh, do better long term than by charging the rock bottom low balls. Mm -hmm. A uh, question from Dana about um, if a freelancer comes to you saying, I'm raising my rates, uh, what is a good way for that freelancer to approach you as the agency owner? Margaret? Uh, yeah, I feel like that's, that's um, we're going to cover that later. Like I was going to just okay. wait on that. Sure. Yeah, the, I, I, because I don't. Yeah, and you've you've got the slides, and so I don't know how where we are in the, the presentation, but I want to make sure we're getting through it all. All right, all right. Keep keep me on. Keep me. But on I will chart. not forget you, Dana. Okay. So um, you uh, the the point here is just uh, figure out what the market can bear, set your rates, and then every year review them and decide uh, taking inflation into account and taking my sales, my, my business last year into account, do I want to creep up a little bit? And if so, what is the, uh, the best way to do that so that I don't alienate any of my existing clients? And, and write it of, down. Pardon? Write it down, have a rate sheet that when someone says, hey, can you do this for me? How much do you charge? You can just say, yeah, let me just email that to you. And you email them the whole thing. It can look kind of like that. You can organize it with prettier tables or whatever, but you know, put your mileage on there, you know, however much you're charging outside of your county or outside of your municipality or whatever it is. And, you know, any exceptions to the rules, any, you know, bundling or, you know, this much for, for per hour minimum of this many hours or minimum half day or minimum full day, how many days be before do they have to cancel or they will be charged for a minimum of, of this many hours or this many days or whatever, write it all down, get it all in there 
and then send just send them the whole thing. You don't have to just type out just the part that they just PDF, attach it. It saves you time and your your time is your money. And so you want to have it already figured out. You don't want to have to sync it through every single time. Have it written out. And then when they say, yeah, can you can you tell me how much you charge? You can look at it and you can email it to them and they can look at it. And I would put the year in the title, say, these are my 2023 rates. And that way you're sort of implying, if you don't contact me for a couple of years, don't expect the rates to be the same. Ask me for my 2026 rates. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, paper trails. Do you need a contract? Uh, probably no for most uh, interpreting jobs. Uh, maybe yes for some big translation jobs. Um, you don't, a contract meaning like a one to three page form. If you're a member of the ATA, they have a sample contract that you can download and just fill in the blanks. It's pre-written so you don't have to get one drafted. Um, I would say if a, if a large entity like the uh, University of Texas were going to hire us to translate a hundred word manual, a hundred page manual, um, <laughs> In a situation like that, where there are thousands of dollars on the line, and we were having to outsource the translation, and there's greater risk involved, then we might send them a contract and say, "This is uh, let's just get this in writing and get the person who's going to pay us to sign it in advance." While for most uh, smaller orders that we could just take us a day or a week to do, an email sort of functions in place of a contract. We we email them the invoice, they mail back and say, "Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and get started." And there we have our paper trail. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important to make sure that it is written out somewhere it needs to be email is is great but do not just take it over the phone and say yeah you know that sounds good yeah you're going to pay me that much okay cool because you have no proof that that phone call ever happened you have to have it in writing emails are fine if and especially you know by accepting this, you know, blah, 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 you imply that you will be paying me this much, da, 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 da and, you know, or you are agreeing to, da, 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 and then they say, yes, please proceed, and there's your contract. Yeah. Um, I, I know some interpreters who, who, like, just do everything out of their phone by texting, um, and they, you know, a client texts and says, hey, can you take this deposition tomorrow? They text back and say, that's fine. And if it's an established client and you trust them, sure, that's fine. But if it's new, like if somebody's referred you to them and you get a text and, and you agree to it and you don't really know who it is and you don't have an address and you don't have um, anything uh, to back up your invoice when it's sent, it really might slip through the cracks. And, and I've learned that lesson the hard way. Um, referrals from other people without email to back it up that came in through text are just hard to follow up on. I mean, you can take a screen capture and say, oh, my colleague sent this to me and look, here's her message. And they'll be like, I don't, I don't even know who this is. What are you talking about? Um, so email is your friend. And if you're going to send emails, make sure that you have a, a professional looking signature line, your name at the bottom underneath your title, you know, Spanish court interpreter, certified translator, whatever, and then your contact information so that they feel confident that you are not a scam. We're going to get into scams in a minute here. There are ways to um, get uh, documents signed um, electronically, like DocuSign um, versus uh, signed papers. But again, uh, contracts are generally uh, just for freelancers who are accepting large assignments with thousands of dollars at stake. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's probably overkill. Um, individual clients, uh, when we sell to individuals, like somebody is going to Spain to study and needs her visa application translated, uh, we will charge that kind of person in advance. While if we're selling to a, a university, a court system, a state uh, company, then um, we'll often wait and um, deliver the translation before we send them the invoice. So no discussion of freelancer finances would be complete without a warning that is very familiar to some of you. Uh, scams are everywhere. And as soon as you get your contact information online as a translator or an interpreter, you attract all of those specialized scams. And it's disappointing. I used to be the guy in charge of the online directory for our local association, the Austin Area Translators and Interpreters Association. <laughs> 
And I remember this one lady joined and she was like all excited to be a member of the AATIA and to have a professional listing online. And within the first week, she got like three contacts from, from potential clients. And she was, she was thrilled like, wow, I spent $35 on this membership and I've already gotten thousands of dollars of work out of it. And by week number two, two, she realized all three of them were scams and she'd been wasting her time. And she was so heartbroken that she, she canceled her membership and association. She's like, that's it, I quit. I don't wanna, I don't wanna be in this business anymore. There's too many bad people out there. It's kind of a, a sad story. If, if you've been doing this for more than a year, you've been getting these and you know what they look like. These are some of the, the warning signs here. There's a, a website called Payment Practices. I think Ted Wazinski, who's past president of the ATA, maybe he created it and has been running it for years. Um, that's a, a place where you can uh, sort of do your due diligence on a company you've never heard of, an interpreter agency, a translation agency, and um, find out if they have had other complaints about them or if they are bad at paying uh, invoices. But just in general, a, a scam email is probably going to have some of these features here. Margaret, do you ever get scam emails from fake agencies? Yes. And these are the reasons, some of the reasons why it's extremely important that your emails do not look like this, that your emails are well written in the language in which they are written, which is most likely English if you're doing business with courts in the United States. Um, you want a, a good and valid email account. If all you have is a Hotmail account or, or an old that's one of an AOL account. I love you, but baby, you need a new email address because those old emails look like scams. They look like scams and people are not going to want to hire you if all you have is a Hotmail account. You would need to have at the very least a Gmail account with a, a, a with your legitimate name on it. Nothing about bunny rabbits or or no fuzzy, numbers. Anything. Yeah, numbers, leave the numbers out. You know, margaret.hansen at gmail.com or, or margaret hansen translator at gmail.com is something that that gives your name and that you are a real human um but then and then the rest of these things don't 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 be this person in your emails because then people are gonna be like oh it looks like a scam and they're gonna brush you aside put 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 credibility indicators is what they're called put credibility indicators in your email have a signature block that that lists a couple of credentials maybe, or at least says, you know, Chinese interpreter or um, ha have, if you have a, an address that can go on there that says, you know, you work in this place or with these people or anything to help lend credence to who you are and your, leg your legitimacy as an interpreter or a translator. Yeah. Thank you. So here's an example of an actual um, email that's going around a few years ago now. Uh, first of all, I've highlighted everything that's sketchy to me. Sizzler is not an actual last name, it's a restaurant. Um, the Gmail account, he says, Cameron, I think it's a he, it could be a she, let's say he, um, represents the Venn group, but then it's a Gmail account. Why isn't the word Venn group the, in the email address? Um, there's, uh, for, after subject, it has re, um, which means that it's a reply to something, but I didn't email Cameron, so why is Cameron replying? All the exclamation points are just uh, sketchy. Uh, irregular capitalization. Um, in USA, native speakers of American English don't say a variety of appointments in USA. We say in the USA. We always use the article. Or in the US. Yeah, or in America. Um, and then there's just so... Everything about this tells me it's not worth uh, replying to. Um, if English is not your native language, I'm not, I'm not casting stones here. Um, that's fine. You don't have to be a perfect speaker of your second language if you uh, grew up speaking another language primarily, but at least uh, put it in Word and run spell check and grammar check. Or if it's an important email that you're sending out to someone you really want to hire you, get a native speaker who's educated in the United States to proofread somebody like Margaret, who's really picky about correct punctuation and capitalization, and they will be happy to go through your email and make it look very natural and uh, trustworthy. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and uh, is it Fernanda? Some, um, I don't have the whole thing, so I can't see what, anything else it says. But Fernanda, um, Gmail is fine. Uh, lots of people that are good, nice, normal people use Gmail. Um, Marco happened to put that on, on this one, but the Gmail isn't the sketchy or, or questionable part because lots of people currently are using Gmail. I mentioned Hotmail and AOL specifically because those are old. And so people who are um, use, uh, who have less access to current internet um, systems are, are more likely to be using those. Um, the reason Gmail is sketchy in this instance is that it it purports to be coming from a business and yet it's coming from a personal account. And so you wanna be sure that whoever is emailing you is emailing you from the business that they say that they work for because they should have a work email. And so that was my uh, office manager just the other day was like, okay, this is kind of a good email, but why is, why is his email? And it, like the email address was just super weird, like super sketchy looking. And it was a Gmail account, but it was obviously personal. And, and so that's what makes it sketchy in this situation, not because it's Gmail, because Gmail is very legitimate, but because he says he works for a company, but he doesn't have a company email address. Yeah. If you're a, a, a sole Yeah, Yahoo, I agree. Stuff. Yahoo. Yeah. Yahoo's kind of right there on the border. If you have Yahoo, you might want to just, because Gmail's free, guys. It's free. You can just set up a Gmail account. Yeah, but do know. Put numbers in it. Yeah, don't put numbers, especially your birth year. For heaven's sake, do not put your birth year in there. Um, your high school and, graduation, whatever that year is. Right, yeah. But do know that the dots don't really mean anything. So I could be Margaret Dot Hansen. I could be, um, well, let me use my middle initial too, just to, to be clear. I could use Margaret B. Dot Hansen or Margaret B. Hansen or Margaret Dot B. Dot Hansen. Like all the dots don't really mean anything because you're going to get all of those. Nobody can have, I can't have Margaret B. Hansen and Somebody else have margaret.b.hanson. They don't let that happen. All of those come to me. So the dots, you can add them in there if you like them or leave them out if you don't. That doesn't really matter. But just know that you're not really changing anything that way. Sprinkle them like confetti or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. A little party there. <laughs> okay. So um, a classic uh, interpreter scam. And this happened to me like back when we lived in McAllen. I think it was for a translation order. I don't know if you remember, Margaret, 20 some years ago. But... Um, so I have, I was in one of the directories for one of the associations and they wanted me to translate something and I was excited because it was like a $2,000 order and they asked, can I send you a check and I was brand new and I fell for it. And so they, they sent me the check. It looked kind of sketchy, but it was a physical check and I took it to the bank and deposited it in there and they gave me money into my account. And so I started translating and the next day, or, or the people kept on emailing and asked, has the check come yet? Have you deposited a check? Has the check come yet? Have you deposited a check? And so finally I told them, okay, it came in, I deposited it. And they said, oh, guess what? The order just canceled, I'm sorry. Um, can you refund it? Well, no, we don't want to ask you to refund it all because you've already done some work. If you could just refund us a portion of it. And then of course it's a fake check and it takes the bank a few days to figure that out. Um, later on, um, somebody is gonna look at it and then they are hoping that you will Western Union the money or pay them by some form that cannot be refunded and then they get to keep all the money and the translation was just bogus anyways. So this is a, a, a classic scam that you'll run into sooner or later. So what happened? Did we lose $2,000? No, um, I, I had saw enough red flags before we got to that point that I never sent them a refund. When they started asking for it, it was, it was how eager they were to find out if I deposited the check that made me nervous. And so uh -huh. I dug into it together and then found out it was a forged check. Or I a feel like there was, Yeah, I feel like there was some instance where the bank themselves, they were like, mm, I don't remember what that one was, but there was one where a banker was, was alert to something and they were like, I wouldn't, we're not going to deposit yeah. this. Good. So, so yeah. So, any payment, uh, legitimate clients do still pay by check in 2023, um, big institutions, um, but uh, individuals, um, individuals never pay us by check anymore, right? Like, not, not individual people, no, uh, yeah. only, only businesses. No, and we're getting some good examples here in the chat about other people yeah. who so, have and 
Yeah. And, and somebody asked if we could explain it again, and, and we did kind of go through it quick. So if you don't, so basically what they're doing is they're sending you a, a fake check and saying, can you do this work for me? You deposit it and start working. And then they say, oh, it canceled, but just send me half of it back because you've already done some of the work. So you send them real money while the bank, before the bank figures out it was fake. And so they give you fake money, you give them real money. And so then you're out however much you've sent. So, yeah. so you wanna just be alert for people who are real anxious to overpay you, to pay you quickly, to get you started right away on things. And all, Mark, go back to the, the previous slide that had some of those things on it. No, one more. Yeah, anonymous Gmail accounts, higher than market rates are being offered. And Nobody volunteers contact. to pay you more than average. They always volunteer yeah. to pay you less and you have to tuck them up. <laughs> yeah, and if, if, there's, if it's hard to find, and like Google them, search them, stalk them, find out who they are, look up their company, look up information about them. Sometimes you'll find people saying, you know, I got contacted by this person and it turned out to be a big scam. And then does somebody else will be like, yeah, me too. Yeah, scam, 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 scam. And you're like walking away. So look up people that are, are reaching out to you to do stuff for them. Uh, yeah, somebody's... good. And Sylvia, Sylvia has a great suggestion. Just pull a sentence out of the, the message and Google it in quotes so that it's all locked together. And you'll find people have posted it like on Reddit or in um, forums. Yeah. Yeah. I get this. I do photography on the side, and they there are photographer scams that are like the one that uh, Siebel just posted there, where they say, "Hey, I need you to take a picture of this group of people at a certain date, and I can uh, pay you in advance by check." And I'm just block, block, block. <laughs> Nobody pays photographers in advance by check. Uh -uh. Pfizer. Okay, go ahead. Oh, somebody impersonating Pfizer. Yeah, they'll, they they use a and they'll they'll pull the actual logo off the website so it looks more legit. Uh -huh. All right, so um, there are lots of good uh, anecdotes to share here, and what I'd like to do is take like um, maybe a five minute uh, breakout room and put everybody in breakout rooms with a partner and uh, suggest that you uh, swap stories um, ab about, uh, these are some questions that you could ask each other or share, um, scams that you've seen, uh, what business structure you find is most useful? Have you changed business structures? Um, do you use uh, contracts? Do you work for agencies or direct clients? And I think by discussing this in small groups, um, we might be able to learn more from each other. Um, I, Dana, I don't have a way of uh, grouping you by language. I'm sorry. Um, um, and I did want to say a couple of good things in the chat. Um, I like the suggestion to ask for a phone number for a brief conversation before starting the job, because if, if they're legit, they'll be glad to do that. And if they're not, that is a good way to scare them off. And um, I can't see whose name it is, Spanish interpreter or something. Um, if you would share, share that email address that you have for the FBI for scams, that'd be great. We'd be glad to have that. Yeah. Okay, so I've um, I've created enough breakout rooms that there will be uh, three to four people per room, and we'll do this for maybe um, five minutes, um, and then you'll see a, a thing up on your screen saying breakout room closing in one minute, and then we'll come back to the main group. Uh, this is the kind of thing that if we were sitting in person, it'd be easier to discuss uh, together uh, because there's sixty people on the call. Um, I think we'll get more accomplished by by visiting in small groups. Uh, here we go, create, open all rooms. So um, you should see a pop-up inviting you to one of those rooms. Hey, Jeanette. Hey, Renee. You were shoved off the screen before, I didn't see you there. I was not wanting to show my face yet this morning. <laughs> This Me neither. <laughs> hey, put us sorry, back. We were, having, we were having a good time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Never long enough. Um, if anybody wants to connect with somebody they met in the breakout room and you didn't have time to exchange information, feel free to use a chat for that. Say, uh, uh, hey, I'm a such and such interpreter. Here's my email if anybody else wants to connect. And then other people can, can copy and paste it out of the chat. 
Um, this is a great opportunity to meet other people who are working on some of the same challenges. And you can direct message them as well in the chat if you don't want to share your email oh. or phone number or whatever contact information with everyone. Just click to select, you know, yeah. to just that person that you want to share that contact information with. Okay. All right. All, all those features are turned on. We haven't restricted it today, like the boss always does from business <clears> meetings. <throat> I mean, not my boss. My boss is very nice, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you better watch yourself. Um, someone has been, I think, accidentally just messaging me instead of the whole group. So just do make sure if you're trying to share something with the whole chat thread that it says to everyone and not just to a specific person. All right. Sounds good. OK, I'm going to go back to the share screen here. Um, and slideshow. So we are moving on now to the second half, really the we're two thirds of the way through. Um, but the second half of the topics uh, is uh, power, the power of invoicing. Invoices are your friend. The first invoice you make is kind of confusing and it's a hassle of figuring out what you want to put on it. But after that, once you get a system down, especially if your software, QuickBooks or whatever generates them for you, um, you can just put all the key information on there and then it's kind of automated. Then you just fill in the details for each assignment that you do or each um, translation that you accept and send it out. And businesses especially love invoices because it's how they, they stay organized. And if uh, you are working for a variety of um, different clients and you want to come up with as much as you can standardize your invoices so you don't have to customize it each time you send it out, will reduce your workload. Um, each client will have a different process for invoicing, like uh, at Texan Translation, we do a lot of work for the University of Texas and Travis County and the State Bar of Texas and some different law firms, and they all have different ways uh, that they process their, um, their invoices. Some of them want to give us a purchase order, some want to send a check, some want to pay electronically online, and it's a hassle. It'd be nice if everything were just a universal system. Um, but it's not. Uh, maybe someday we'll get there. And um, that reminds me, Seth Hammock, if Margaret, if you see Seth Hammock on, would you let me know so I can ask him about Go Signify? Yeah, I um, haven't seen him yet, though. Okay. Um, but uh, with each new client you take, part of the initial negotiation conversation in advance should be who do I send my invoice to and uh, what is your invoicing procedure? They might have a web form that you click on, like Text and Translation. We send our um, people who work for us, we send them to a web form where they can upload their invoice and put in some details like our order number. Margaret, as the person who pays our freelancers, how do you feel about order numbers, invoice numbers? Oh. So <laughs> this is this slide right day. here. Just, just a 30 this, second version. This, okay. Oh, so just like Marco had his red t-shirt at the beginning, my red t-shirt for you is make it easy for me to pay you. That's it. Make it easy for me to pay you. Give me all of the information that I need to be able to pay you. So if I give you an invoice number, some sort of order number, give it back to me. Like if I say, here, can you translate this thing? It's order number one, two, three, four, five. Then when you invoice me, you say, hey, I did order number one, two, three, four, five for you. Can you pay me? That way I can easily link those two things together and go, oh, yep, this is the guy that did order one, two, three, four, five. I will pay them. Otherwise, I think, oh, let's see, Frank Valderrama. Frank, Frank, do I know somebody named Frank? And then I'm having to go through my system. <laughs> Frank says I am 150 bucks. I don't know why. I don't even know what language Frank speaks. Let's see. And then I'm having to spin my wheel searching and searching and searching for information that you should just tell me. Tell me, this is when I did it, this is what I did, this is how much I did it, and this is this is what we agreed. And you it, it, reference anything that you want to make it easy for me to go, oh yeah, Frank, yep, I owe him 150 bucks. He did a great job for me two weeks ago. Make it easy. <laughs> make sure you know how they will pay you or how you prefer to be paid. You've got to have some give and take there. You can't just say, I will only be paid by Venmo because if they don't have Venmo, Guess you're not getting paid. You need to have some <laughs> options for receiving money because they will have some options, but maybe not a lot 
for how they're going to pay you. And so if it's a big company, probably it's going to be a check. They may do ACH direct deposits. Smaller businesses are not going to be able to do that. They may do checks um, cut from their bank. Well, they may handwrite a check. I don't know why I never handwrite a check. Um, they may do Zelle um, or they may do some other direct payment method like that. Um, but if you're if you don't live in the U.S., options are different, and some countries receive have have these options for receiving funds like Wise Business or Transfer um, Transfer Wise is Wise Business now. Um, World Remit, um, PayPal. There are different ways to do it, but you need to have a few. You you need to have more than one option for ways that you're willing to receive money. And I would say receive money all the ways you can, and make it easy for the employer to pay you. Thank you. And one of the questions in the chat was about um, a, a portal for submitting contractor invoices. And I'm just going to show you the one we use for text and translation. If we hire you to translate something for us and you send it back, then we're going to point you towards this little web form where you tell us your name, your email, any comments you want. You can upload an invoice if you've already generated one in QuickBooks or something, but we don't even require you to give us an invoice as long as you tell us these basic details. And then you click here and you put in the order number, the order name and the amount and hit submit. And so this is a, a way that we like to funnel things into our bookkeeping system so that we don't forget to pay you. And that order number, you see it has a star, order number, order name and amount. Any information that the person hiring you gives you, if there's a case number or, or uh, um, defendant or, or, or respondent names or um, dates that you worked, times that you worked, points of contact that you worked with, name people's names so that the person paying, if, I, if, if you only dealt with Alejandra, then I can go back to Alejandra and say, this Frank Valderrama guy keeps bugging me about 150 bucks. Ale, why should I pay this guy? And she, sorry, I'm picking on you, Frank. You're just right there at the top of my screen. <laughs> I want to be sure that Frank gets Frank money. Frank would never do that. Frank would say, yeah. I will hand you cash, Frank. Um, but the more information you can give so that they, they can quickly and easily see, ah, yes, this is a person who did work for me. Um, is this too complex or confusing? Uh, well, my chat just disappeared. Where'd it go? There was some. Okay. And, and, and somebody, people are direct messaging me. Don't direct message me if you okay, want everyone to see it. about uh, a, late, a late fee percentage. I think we do 5% a month for, for late fee. And we put that on every invoice to call people's attention to the fact that we are going to follow up if you don't pay us in a month. Right. And we don't always charge it, but saying that we, we will gives us the option to, you know, yeah. and you, you don't want to burn bridges for good clients. So you don't want to be you know, with late fees for somebody who's regularly sending you work. And then once in a while they're late. Yeah, you know, I would, I would let that slide. But if somebody is not paying you and you need to get their attention, you can stop. You, you've got the option to put that late fee on there. And, uh, but if you didn't mention it in your first invoice, then you can't just pull it out of a, a hat 30 days later. Right, right. So if you are a freelancer, then um, it would be good to, uh, as you're leaving an interpreting assignment or as you're sitting there, you know, at the end of a deposition, just pull out your phone and on the app, send the invoice right then. That's the best time to send it because that will get you paid the fastest and it'll make it easiest for the bookkeeper to match you up with a certain job. All right, any questions in the chat to address now? If the client doesn't pay a uh, client abroad, oh, if you have clients from other countries, it gets much more difficult um, than if they're local clients. Um, we, I, I've, uh, as a freelancer, back before Texan Translation existed, I remember freelancing for a company in France, translating French into English, and it was just a small order, it was like 30 bucks. And back then, 20 years ago, there was no simple way for them to send 30 bucks to the United States. Like the fee for a wire transfer was $50. And uh, they, you know, mailing a check uh, would have cost uh, half the amount that they wanted to send. And so I ended up just canceling that invoice and not getting paid for it. Um, but it depends a lot on what country they're in and what country you're in. If it's EU, if you live in the EU and the client lives in the EU, it's a lot easier because of all of the, um, cutting edge banking that uh, those countries share, but the US banking system is surprisingly backward. It's hard to make electronic transfers in the US. Zelle is like 
pretty good. Um, if you if your bank uses the Zelle system, um, that's becoming uh, simpler and more common and no fee. Um, yes, I agree in the in the chat. Uh, there's probably any any bookkeeping software you have will have a way of generating invoices for you. It'll just ask you to fill in the blanks um, with the details that you want to um, include your terms, your rates, your late fee, uh, job ID, and so forth. Here is an example of a simple invoice. This is uh, one from an actual job um, that I found on my computer at work yesterday. Uh, I've put a blue square over the private information, our client's contact information, and the job details. Uh, but you'll see that it's clean, it's clear, it has um, everything they need to know about how to get a hold of us. It has our little company logo up there. You don't need a logo for your company, but they're surprisingly easy to get. So think about <laughs> finding a logo eventually. <laughs> um, it uh, will identify clearly um, all of their details, their job, like this was from a court reporting firm, I think that hired me for deposition. No, $100 an hour, that would have been from the, the criminal courts. And so they have a cause number and style and maybe a job number that I want to include on there to make sure that it's as easy as possible for them to pay me. Because remember Margaret's t-shirt, make it easy for your clients to pay you. Uh, I don't know what the net of net 15 means, except that it means like you've got 15 days. Um, so like you've got 15 days to pay or net 30, we've got net, you've got 30 days to pay or net 45 would be you've got 45 days to pay. I don't know why they call it net. I don't know what that comes from. Um, and I would say two to four weeks is, is pretty typical for, for most invoices. Um, and again, if somebody's a, a little late paying you, that's fine. As long as if, if it's somebody that you know is going to pay you, then I wouldn't sweat it. But if, if they're not, or they tend to be unreliable and, you know, it's, it's, it just have to decide how much nagging you want to do. But I appreciate this slide, Marco. Um, Put all the information on there that you can. Just you know, the the more time you can save the person trying to pay you, the more likely it is that they will want to hire you and pay you again. The simpler it is for me to give you money, the easy, the more likely it is that I will want to do it again. If I have to work hard to figure out who you are and what job you did and whether you did it well and how much I really pay you and how I'm going to have to how I'm going to pay you, then you're trouble, and you're taking my time. <laughs> And I don't want to spend it, you know? And so the easier you make it for me to pay you, the more likely it is, regardless of your work, assuming that, that, that you know, Nina and Frank and Dana and Alejandra are all equal in their skill. If, if Nina's the easiest one to pay, I don't want to go to Nina because I just, you know, sell her some money and I'm done. And yeah. if Alejandra never puts any invoice numbers, any order numbers, anything, I know you'll do it, Alejandra. I believe in you. But if she doesn't, then it just makes my life complicated. And I'm having to spend time that I don't have in order for you to get paid. Why, why am I going to do that? You know? All right. So the escalators here represent the escalation of pressure that you as a freelancer are putting on your client when they don't pay you. Um, first of all, remember that email is not 100% reliable. Email is like 95% reliable, but lots of emails don't get to the right person. Sometimes they're in the spam filter. Sometimes they're just, who knows, they get zapped. They get abducted by aliens. <laughs> so if you send an email with an invoice to somebody and a month later they haven't responded, assume that they never saw it. Give them the benefit of the doubt because most people are honest. Most people want to do a good job and they want to pay you what they owe you. So make sure that your first contact with them is super polite and says something like, hey, I'm just following up on the invoice I sent on this date. Um, and I want to confirm that you got it. First of all, confirm they know about it. And they might go scrambling and say, oh no, it's in my spam. Sorry, I just saw it. Or they might say, yeah, I, I've seen it. Um, that'll be processed so-and-so. And they'll probably volunteer the next step. They'll tell you when you can expect your payment. Um, if you see that you're coming up on your late fee, like if we have a 30 day policy um, and at the day 25, they still haven't paid us, um, that's an excellent time to send this little friendly reminder because sometimes they'll scramble and say, oh, we have five more days, okay. I'm uh, sending it today. Uh, please let me know when you got it. And then everybody wins. They don't have to pay the late fee and you get paid. 
while if you wait until the 30 day point and the second time they've ever heard from you, or maybe the first time they've noticed a message from you is with a late fee attached, and that's gonna leave sort of a, a bad taste in their mouth. Um, and Paula asking a good question. If, you, if you're if you busy and can't always invoice immediately, I would say like at the end of a week, um, go through and make sure you've done all your invoicing. I would say that's a great Friday afternoon thing to do. Or if there's a particular day of your week that tends to be a little slow, maybe it's a Wednesday afternoon or whatever, but just pick a day each week that you set aside some time. And that's something that as a, a freelancer, you have to work into your schedule you you don't interpret 40 hours a week you interpret a certain number of hours and you have to set aside time and and roll that time into your pricing structure um for your admin for your invoicing for your quickbooks reconciliations and making sure all your paperwork is in line and your marketing and all those things um and so you need to build that into your weekly schedule making sure that you've sent your invoices out following up on invoices you haven't heard from, maybe adding that late fee to somebody who hasn't paid you in the time frame that you established or sending them a, a reminder saying, hey, that late fee is gonna kick in next week. So I just wanted to, to follow up with you. But I would say, if you can do that every week, um, that would be a good idea. If you have a repeat client and you say you don't want to invoice for every single job, then we've got some that we just keep an invoice open for the whole month. And at the end of the month, we close it out, send it off, and then with a line item for each order. Yeah, just saying on this date, this was done, on this date, this was done, on this date, this was done. And and we have one client um that we just said, look, we've got a minimum of, you know, we set an, a minimum uh dollar amount for them, like fifty dollars was the minimum invoice. And so so what they were collecting for the month. And if if they only sent us one job that month, then they owed us 50 bucks. And if they had a bunch of jobs and it was 150 or 300 or 500 dollars great but um but we would just collect all those together yeah so that we're not doing tons and tons of invoicing for every three dollars five dollars twelve dollar jobs um and it's easier for their bookkeeping as well right so you you have to develop a policy based on the preferences of each client and keeping track of who likes what is is a headache but it's part of being your own bookkeeper mm -hmm. Um, the last bullet here is fire bad clients. Oh, and in, in response, I forgot uh, to the question of how late is too late to send an invoice. I've sent invoices as late as like a month or five weeks, and it's kind of embarrassing, but uh, it's better than not sending it at all. When you get to the point where it's been like six months, they're probably not going to pay it. Uh, a lot of organizations will have a policy that you have to invoice them within 60 days or 90 days, and after that, it's just canceled out. I know one of the staff interpreters at one of the courts here in our county said that she got some invoices from an interpreter like a year and a half after the job, and they had no records anymore to verify that the jobs were ever done, and so they just had to say, sorry, it's, it's too late. And the interpreter who sent it didn't even give an explanation for why she'd taken a year and a half to invoice. She just mailed it off like it's no big deal, and uh, I guess was crossing her fingers and hoping that somebody would uh, pay it automatically without actually reading it. Yeah. Okay. And finally, fire bad clients, meaning if somebody is giving you trouble and they're more of a headache um, than they're worth, uh, as a freelancer, you are welcome to just uh, stop accepting assignments from them. And it's great. You can do the 80 20 analysis and figure out what 20% of your clients are sending you 80% of your money and what 20% are giving you 80% of your headaches and just focus your attention on the on the best ones and let the other ones go to somebody else say oh i'm sorry i'm not available for that assignment here let me refer you to a new a new interpreter i know who's really looking for work and i uh, won't mind dealing with somebody like you except don't say that out loud say that say that to your coworker. yeah <laughs> don't want to burn bridges um and marco we've got a good question in the chat from paula about uh, a great client that she's had for a long time um, who has been reliable with payments until recently and now has gotten behind. Um, and, and again, you don't want to burn a bridge on a good client. You don't want to, you don't, I would, I would argue with, um, I can't say your name, Dudija, um, 
about the next step being you're taking them to court. I would not actually do that. I would recommend against that because if they're a good client, this may be the end of your relationship. Court is, you say, I'll take you to court when you when you want to burn that bridge and you want to say, I don't want to work with you ever again. And so I would actually suggest a phone call to say, hey, I noticed that um, you guys have gotten a little behind on payments. What can I do here? What? How can we get you guys back up to speed and find out if maybe, because probably my, my guess is that there's been a change in who's doing the paying, either your the, the person's name has changed and so now your your invoices are being forwarded to somebody else and they're not getting forwarded in time or it's just somebody new to the job who doesn't know what they're doing and they're slower getting payments out or there there's been some glitch if they've been good up until august then there's been some change that has caused the the delay in payments to happen and they need to know that there's a problem they may not even realize that there's a problem maybe it's this new person who just has no idea how things used to be done. And so you want to figure out how to how to how to help with this. Is there someone else you should email? Should you CC someone on the email? Is there a different format that needs to be figure out what 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 happened so that you can iron that out? Because if they're a good solid client and they owe you six thousand bucks since August, that's a lot of money and that's good money that you're making. So you want to keep that client if you can. But something happened in August, and I'm guessing somebody no longer works there that used to pay you regularly and the new kid doesn't quite know what they're doing. That's, that's my, my guess. So. And they're, would, they're probably, would, they're probably going through bankruptcy right now and they're just uh, scared to tell you. Maybe. Um, that's, that's my maybe. take. Yeah. Could be. Oh, she said she's been calling them weekly. Oh, yeah. well then. Hmm. Um, the next step after calling to escalate, you start sending um, invoices with late fees by certified mail return receipt requested to the physical mm -hmm. address. And that way, either they will reject the mail and send it back to you, or they will have to sign the little postcard that gets mailed back to you. And that will give you more um, evidence when you have to eventually take it to small claims court. Yeah, either way, whether it's returned mail and, and, and you can say, this is the address they gave me and they're not even accepting mail there anymore. Or look, they signed for it and they're still not paying. It's good either way. Not great yeah. either way, but good. Yeah. So these are some uh, typical uh, mistakes to avoid. Forgetting invoice, invoicing really late, invoicing the wrong person, invoices that are unclear, um, typos, maybe uh, an important typo, like how many hours of work you did or how many dollars they owe you. And then they pay that invoice, but then you discover the mistake and you have to go back and fix it. That gets a lot more complicated. Um, if they have uh, emailed you back and you haven't seen it, or they called you and it went to voicemail and they have a question they're waiting for you to answer before they can pay you, that's gonna hold things up. Um, not accepting, let's say, purchase orders from a a large institutional client purchase orders are really, we can all accept purchase orders. It just is sort of like, a, it's like an invoice that hasn't been paid yet. It's sort of like a mini contract to promise to pay something. Um, so it, there's no magic to purchase orders. Uh, if it's yeah. coming from an organization large enough to send purchase orders, then you can trust that they will um, be paying you once you submit the payment afterwards. And then biting the hand that feeds you, just being rude to the person that writes your checks. You want to be nice to that person. He or she is your friend. And the purchase order number, that's another item that needs to go onto your invoice. When you're, in, when you're saying, hey, you owe me money for this work I did, put that purchase number on it because that nobody cares about the purchase number except the person paying you. And that's the person you want to keep happy. Yes. The Margaret. <laughs> So if you have to take legal action against a client, this is very rare. Most interpreters never do it in the career. Um, I had to do it one time and it turned out fine. It's uh, not as complicated or scary as you'd think. Uh, every state and some jurisdictions within a state will have a different process, but it's called a small claims case or suing in small claims court. Uh, locally, any lawsuit up to $20,000 can be filed as a small claim. You can do it pro se. You don't need to hire an attorney to do it for you. There's just a little packet of information you download, a form you fill out. And 
understand that this is after you've exhausted the escalation steps we saw before, including a, a certified letter with return receipt requested if it's if you have a mailing address for the person. And if you don't have a mailing address, that's a, that's a problem to begin with. You, you want to have a mailing address before you accept the job that is payable upon delivery. Um, if you don't have the means to pay for the fee for small claims court, at least in our jurisdiction, they will waive those. It's like uh, an indigent voucher. You say, this is how much I make. I can't afford to pay these fees. And so you can file for free um, and get your $6,000 back or however much they owe you for your interpretation or your translation. Um, they will, that client will never hire you again. If it's a colleague, they'll never speak to you again. The relationship is over. Um, and so you have to you know, weigh how important that is to you. Um, the, the karmic debt that you're taking on, is it gonna be paid for in the check that comes in the mail? Um, but you probably don't actually have to go before the judge. You can probably just fill out the form and then send a photocopy of it by certified mail return receipt requested to the person that owes you money and say, here is the small claims form um, with all of your information and all the paperwork attached that I'm going to take to court in 30 days to file against you. I'm sorry that it's come to this. This is an unpleasant situation for me. I'm sure there are situations going on that I don't understand that you're in, but, um, this is enough money that I can't afford to just uh, write it off as an individual proprietor. You know, write some nice little email or, or letter like that and send it to them. And a lot of people, when they see that they are about to be taken to court, that will motivate them. Suddenly, your bill will go up to the top of their stacks of their accounts payable and they'll pay you next or else they'll make a token payment. At least they'll start paying it down, even if they're going through bankruptcy. And then if they don't, if they ignore you, if they reject the letter or whatever, then you actually file it with the court. And uh, there's a process where the court will send notification to them that they're being sued. They'll have a chance to respond. There will be a date sent to appear before the judge and present evidence. You can request a jury trial if you want. And, and then, I mean, you probably know how the civil lawsuit process goes from having interpreted in court before, but it's a, it's a little mini. Or watch TV. Yeah. Pardon? or watch TV. Um, yeah. But like Marco said, you're probably never going to get that far. You're probably never going to even need to file a claim, never mind, take it past the sending a copy to the, the offending party. Um, but it's good to know that it exists, that there is recourse, that there is an option, uh, but, it, but it is kind of a nuclear option, like Marco said. There, there's no going back. Once you send that, um, they're not your friend anymore. And, and that's that's life. Everybody doesn't have to be your friend. Everybody doesn't doesn't have to be your client. But um, but it's always a shame to to lose a colleague or a client if if you've enjoyed working with them in the past. But it is it's out there. Yep. But it'll probably never happen to you if you wear your team jersey here and find out in advance who's going to be paying you and agreeing writing with that person on your rates and terms. And by the way, if you invoice them and they have not yet paid you, but they book you to do another job, that's a red flag. Um, if they have an outstanding invoice, if it's been 32 days since you invoiced them for the last job and they're like, oh, sorry, well, I'll, I'll get that check sent you next week, but I've got an emergency depot. Can you do this right now? The answer is no. Um, and you can yeah. just say, sorry, I have a policy against um, doing more work for somebody who has uh, outstanding overdue <laughs> invoices against me. And that's the way you staunch the bleeding before the wound gets uh, infected. Yeah, and that, that's such a good point because, because it's hard work to find an interpreter. Like we have to respect the fact that somebody is calling all of you guys, going down their list and going, oh, is this guy ready? Is this guy available? Can I, can I book this one? And someone has to do that. And that's, that's a high pressure situation that they, are trying to get this done because there's a judge breathing down their neck thing. We've got to have somebody at this time for this case that, you know, and so if somebody is saying, yeah, no, you know, you're my, I, I like you guys, but you didn't pay me. So sorry, I can't do that. That, that just tightens the screw a little bit and makes their job a little harder. And so then they're tightening the screw on the guy who's supposed to pay you and saying, Hey, we need to get that done because the, the interpreter that we like won't work for us now. And we like them. They do a good job. They show up on time. They don't smell weird. We want that one to work for us. <laughs> hey, <True> story. <laughs> yeah. 
but but again, be be as tactful as you can because you don't want to burn this bridge. You want to right. gently right. remind them because right. normal right. people overlook emails. We all do it, and we yeah. want other people to give us the benefit of the doubt too. So this is our contact information. It is also in the slides that you got, and I'm going to cut and paste this little uh, link here since it's not clickable on the screen share.